All right, now in the book of Judges here, chapter number one, we saw a, a pretty good recap of everything that happened through the book of Joshua. Of course, we already finished our Wednesday night Bible study going through every chapter of the book of Joshua. That was the first book as a church that we went through. Now we're continuing on into the book of Judges. Chapter number one was a good recap of, of a lot of the great victories uh, through the life of Joshua. And then it kind of transitions after the death of Joshua, all the problems and troubles that people start to have. That's a real brief overview summary of chapter one. Now in chapter two, we're going to see another similar summary because we see some things that, are, that have been already brought up in the book of Joshua. Joshua, where, and I'm going to get into it a little bit more detail, but first they say how, um, you know, why did you make a league with the people of the land? I told you not to make a league with the people of the land. Therefore, it's going to cause you problems and cursings. And then um, after that, it talks about how when the leaders of the land died that knew the Lord, like Joshua and all the other elders and the people who saw the great works of the Lord, then you know, another generation rose up that didn't know the Lord, and then they start worshiping other gods and everything else. And we saw that in the book of Joshua as well. But then what we get to in the second half of the book of Judge of chapter 2 is kind of the outline for the whole rest of the chapter. Because the book of Judges, what we continually see is that the children of Israel get into trouble by worshiping other gods. They, they stray away from the Lord, and then they you know, become oppressed because that's what happens when you get away from God. You're going to come into bondage. You're going to go into oppression. And then what happens is they cry out to God. And they're, oh, God, we're sorry. You know, we won't do this again. So God raises up a judge, someone to deliver the people. And then God's with the people or God's with the judge. The judge delivers the people. Then everything's going great. The judge dies and then kind of repeat, right? They go, they, they backslide, they come back and forth. And that's what the whole rest of the chapter, this is just from a real high level. We're going to dig into the details now, but that's what chapter two is about. It gives you a good outline for what the rest of the book is going to be. Let's look at verse number one here in chapter number two. The Bible says, and an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land, which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Now, I'm going to pause right here and just point out there's a few places in the Bible that I think it's very possible. I'm not saying 100% for sure, but I think it's possible that where the Bible says an angel of the Lord or the angel of the Lord could be an Old Testament reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the word angel, oftentimes when people think of an angel today, you think of like a creature or being with wings, or you think of like Michael the archangel or things like that. There are beings that God created that you can call an angel. That are, that are heavenly creatures or heavenly beings. But the word angel itself literally means messenger. And oftentimes God even uses, you know, man to be messengers that can be angels delivering a message to somebody. So just because you see the word angel in scripture, first of all, doesn't mean that it's talking about necessarily some special heavenly creature that you would think of, that people commonly think of to be an angel. Because a word means to be a messenger, and that's what they're going to do is to, is to give a message. But I also think that occasionally in Scripture you could find an angel being referred to as Jesus Christ himself being that messenger. Of course, in the Old Testament he's not known as Jesus Christ, but we know that there are Old Testament appearances of Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why I think this might be one of those places is because if you look at this, it says an angel, an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. So it's all speaking like in the first person, like, hey, I'm, I brought you up out of Egypt. I made this promise. I made this covenant and I'm not going to break that covenant with you. So normally when pe you know, people can speak in the first person like that, but normally they'll say, thus saith the Lord. Right. You see Isaiah, Jeremiah, they'll say, hey, thus saith the Lord, I knew, you know, I brought you up out of Egypt. But here we don't have that same reference. We don't we don't have them quoting and saying, hey, this is what God said. So for that re for that reason is one of the reasons why I think that this could very easily be talking about Jesus appearing to them. 
just in the Old Testament coming to them. And, uh, you know, we see Melchizedek as a picture of Jesus Christ, but the Bible says he was without mother, without father, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. It, that's obviously talking about deity. That's God. That's talking about uh, the human, the incarnate version of God, which is Jesus Christ. And there's other references. I'm not going to go into all the other references in the Old Testament that we can see that, but I think this is another one of those places. And he says here in, in verse number two, and ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Now, if you remember the story, the story is uh, from the book of Joshua, of course, where the, the oh, which people was it? The Ammonites. I don't remember which group of people it was offhand right now, but they came down and, and they, were, they were feigning to be someone else. They were, they were pretending to be people from a far off land. Because, what was it? Gibeonites. The Gibeonites. The Gibeonites came and they said, you know, like, hey, we're from, we're from really far away. And they said, see, look at our bread and look at our bottles of wine. Look at, you know, look at this stuff is really old. And they were just dressed up in costumes to make it look like they came from a really far place away. And they're just like, we heard about the Lord and, you know, we want to make a pact with you. We want, we want to make a non-aggression pact, right? We're going to be there for you. We're going to, we're going to join the league together. And uh, at first, the children of Israel, Joshua was just like, well, wait, where are you guys from? You know, they're starting to question them. But then they end up making the deal with them and uh, they didn't do enough diligent search. They didn't go and ask the Lord, hey, should we make a, a deal with these guys? Should we make a league with them? And I'm not going to re-preach that sermon. You could go back and listen in the book of Joshua. I, I covered a lot of details on that. And then as a result, because they made that league with them, they made an oath, they made a vow. They decided, well, we can't go back on that. We swear before the Lord that we're not going to harm these people. We're not going to hurt them. So it was more important to keep their word than it was at that point to, to wipe them out as God had originally commanded them to do. Because what God told them to do is you're supposed to go in and destroy the Canaanites, destroy the people of the land, and they're not supposed to leave any living. And again, that's a whole, I've already gone into why they had to destroy everybody. But I mean, it just, it should at least go to show you how wicked those people were when God was bringing his judgment upon them. And you read the book of Leviticus 18 through 20, and you'll see exactly why God wanted to just exterminate everybody out of the land because it had just gotten so bad. Similar to the way he did with the flood. And Noah, the things had gotten so bad in the world at that time, people had gotten so wicked that God just said, well, here's my solution to that. I'm going to pour out my wrath and send a flood and I'm going to save Noah and his family. And everyone else is going to get destroyed. It had gotten so bad in Sodom and Gomorrah that God just rained fire and brimstone down and says, you know what, there's no more hope for this place. We're just going to burn it down. We're done with it. And the Canaanites were in a similar position. They're just, they, they'd become reprobate as a, as a nation. And God brought his judgment upon them by using the children of Israel to come in and simultaneously was able to then give them an inheritance and give them a promised land that he had promised to Abraham. So uh, God was able to perform many tasks simultaneously because he's God and able to, to make those things work out. So, um, so here we, we see this story brought up again. You know, why have you done this? Verse number three, wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And the reason why this story is even being brought up is because it, it <laughs> in the context, it makes perfect sense because the reason why the, the children of Israel end up going back and forth between straying away from God and getting right with God and straying away. Why they even have those problems to begin with is because they didn't listen to God to begin with. Because they were warned not to have, you, know, you need to get this out. You need to tear their altars down. You need to leave no trace, no remnant of how they worship their gods. I don't even want you questioning about it, wondering about it. And if all the people were gone, that could just die off. And if they burn down the altars and there was nothing left of them, the next generation isn't going to be like, hey, I wonder what, you know, 
What's that all about? Oh, that's pretty interesting. How they were, you know, that wouldn't be there in their land. But that's not what happened because the people were mingled with them. They, they were living in the land with them. So inside of their very own nation, which is different than going out to another country. I mean, obviously there's nothing to stop them from traveling, going to some other country and seeing how other people worship their God somewhere else. But it's different than having that all confined within your own borders, within your own homeland, and being like, wow, look at, look how these people worship, look how those people worship. And that's what we're getting today with such a huge mix of all these various uh, religions, even in the United States of America, you get this, this thinking of, well, everyone's all worshiping the same God, and it's all, you're all just on a different path, but it's all the same God. There's just... It's nonsense. It's actually out of the pit of hell. It's, it's a very wicked, damaging, destructive Amen. type of philosophy. And that's what it is. It's a philosophy saying that, oh, well, there's really only one God and everyone's just worshiping. It doesn't matter if you're Muslim. It doesn't matter if you're Hindu or Buddhist. Yes, it does matter. Absolutely it matters because Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's very exclusive. It has to be through Jesus Christ. And when people don't have Christ, they're going to die and go to hell. And they're going to spend an eternity in the flames of hell, being tortured and tormented forever. So yeah, it is a big deal when people try to say, oh yeah, it's, it, it's all just the same God. They all just teach morals. Uh, no, there's a lot more to it than that. Right. <laughs> a lot more to it. Like, like the way of salvation. But they just look at it as a book of morals because they probably think you have to do good to be saved anyways. It's a lot more than that. So when the, the children of Israel grow up with this and they see these other, you know, the kids, they say, of course, during the days of Joshua and all the people that, that were around during the time, they, they knew the Lord. They saw the power of God. They had no doubt in their mind who God is. But over time, and having these heathen left in the land to still retain their religion and retain their altars and, and the way that they worship their gods, these children grow up and, and they start getting, oh, hmm. Who's to say that's not God? And then here we have all of the problems and we can see, we can look back on history and just see this is what happened. And this is the way that people are. And, uh, uh, you know, people, human beings haven't changed. That's, that's the sinful human nature that we have and we need to, to watch out for. And because of their disobedience, then God says there in verse number three, he says, wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you. But they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. A snare is a trap. Their gods now are just going to be harmful to you. They're just going to be a trap for you to fall in, and a trap that's going to bring a lot of people to hell. Verse number four. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voice and wept, and they called the name of that place Bokim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. Verse number six. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Of course, I just mentioned that. Here we're reading that again. Verse number eight. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. So Joshua lived a very long life, lived to be 110 years old. It says here they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill, Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And this is the transition. So, you know, these, the, the Bible is very good at bringing us up to speed and, and the context is telling us, okay, now we're, we're switching from the life of Joshua, which is what the whole book of Joshua is pretty much about. We see, you know, we're finishing up with Moses and his leading of the children of Israel, the crossing of the Red Sea, you know, for, through the 
Exodus and, and we read through the law, Deuteronomy. And we ended up getting into the book of Joshua. Joshua carries forward, gets him in the promised land, has all those victories. Now Joshua has died. And we're going to see what happens to the children of Israel in the promised land. They, God's brought them into the promised land. God's given them this great land. And, and, and now they are possessing it. And kind of early on, they've made some critical mistakes that are going to end up causing them problems for generations to come and ultimately is going to be their downfall. When they get, when they get brought into captivity, into Babylon, why, why is it that they go into captivity? Because they worship other gods. What are the first two commandments? I am the Lord. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Right? And thou shalt not make thyself any graven images. And bow down and worship them. So the first two commandments they made in the Ten Commandments, written in stone, have to do with worshiping God and not worshiping anyone else and not building any graven images and nothing like that. It's so important. <laughs> we run into people oftentimes too, and, and I understand it, especially when they're not Christians or they're not believers. When they say, well, I'm just going to let my children decide for themselves what they want to believe. For I understand that from an unsaved perspective. But from a Christian family, you're a believer. You better not be that reckless with your children of just saying, well, I'm just going to leave it up to that. They don't want to go to church. They don't have to go to church. I'm just going to let them figure it out. You just sort of say, well, just, let's just toss them to the wolves and hopefully they make it out okay. No, it's incumbent upon us as parents, especially as believing parents, you need to teach your children the right way. You need to teach them the ways of the Lord. Teach them about salvation. Get them in church. I don't care if they don't want to be in church. You get them here anyways. They need to hear the truth. They need to hear it from somebody. They don't, want it. They don't need to be hearing the philosophy of the world saying, oh, well, it doesn't really matter where you go. They're going to pick it up enough as it is out in the world. Just in general, they're going to hear it. They need to be inoculated against that with some good dose of truth. Some good wisdom. And that's going to have to come directly from the parents at home. Parents have the most influence in their kids' lives. The number one person, that is a mom and dad, have the most impact on how your children grow up. Or they ought to. You're, you're, you're given that responsibility and, and naturally you're going to have that influence because a child's going to be depending on you. The only way you could give up being the number one influencer on your child is if you abandon them and leave them for someone else to raise, leave them for someone else to, to, to deal with, to feed and clothe and protect and teach. All the problems result because here it says another generation after them which knew not the Lord nor yet the works which he had done for Israel came up. To some, a new generation, some kids that just weren't taught about God, weren't taught about the Bible. And then all of a sudden what do they end up doing? They go after other gods and then judgment comes. Why? Because God's not just some figment of our imagination. God's not like Santa Claus. God's real. God does see you when you're sleeping and know when you're awake. God knows everything. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. That word Balaam is plural. That when you see an I am after the, the word there, typically it's going to mean it's plural. And Baal is just a false god. Baal is one of many false gods. Um, basically, it's Satan worship. But just like all Satan worship, or almost all, it's disguised as being something that's good, right? Something that, that looks great and, and, and people will talk well about even though you're literally going to be worshiping the devil. The Bible says to be not deceived because, you know, Satan was an angel of light and no marvel that his ministers are going to be ministers of light and that's how they're going to approach you. Satan is one of the best con men in the world and a good con man 
isn't going to try to gain your confidence and get you to put trust in him by coming out with horns and a pitchfork and going, <laughs> right? That's a silly example or view of Satan. That's not who he is at all. He's going to come to you real smooth and real suave and he's going to heal. He'll be dressed nice. He'll be looking real good. He'll be able to speak really well. He'll be playing the, the, the music you want to hear. He'll try to draw you in. That's, what, that's who Satan is. The children of Israel, when they served Balaam, because you know what? When it comes to Satan worship, it doesn't matter. It could be any number of false religions. Because anything that's not of God is false and a lie and, and is, a, is just a fake God. So Balaam, there's many Baals. And you know what? Satan, yeah, he wants to be worshipped, but I think more than anything, he doesn't care which religion you choose as long as it's not the Lord. So he has the luxury of, hey, I've got the, the wide gate, right? Destruction, come on this way. You can, follow you can follow Muhammad to destruction. You can follow Buddha to destruction. You can follow Joel Osteen to destruction. You can follow any of these guys to destruction. I don't care. Just, just go that way. Don't go to Jesus. But the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They served Balaam. Look at verse number 12. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods. And this is, they didn't just make up their own gods. They didn't just say, well, I don't like the Lord, so I'm just going to make up my own God. No. You know who they followed? It says, of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And notice it said earlier in verse 11, it said that they served Baalim. And now it's spelling out in verse 13, Baal and Ashtaroth. Baalim is plural. So Ashtaroth is just another Baal. It's another, another false god. Baal, Ashtaroth. And um, Ashtaroth, if you, if you remember, if you noticed, was, is actually the name of a city. And you'll find throughout the Bible, people will be named Baal, whatever, or cities will be named Baal, Parazim, or whatever, because they're, they're, they've been just so much have gone after these false gods. I mean, Ashtaroth was literally the name of the city of um, Og, the king of Bashan. One of the, one, of the, one of the cities that he owned that was in his realm was Ashtaroth. And it's because they worshipped a false god. So they named an entire city after their false god, their false god worship. And um, that's, that's how much they were into that. And God was like, no, we're not going to have any of that. And oftentimes you'll find, too, within, as the children of Israel took over places, they're going to change the names. You know, it used to be called Luz, now it's called Bethel. It used to be called this, now it's, you know, and, and start changing some of the names. And... Um, getting rid of some of the, some of the remnants of, of the Baal worship. Verse number 14, the Bible says, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And it, that, that phrase is used twice in this chapter. The anger of the Lord is hot. That means God's really angry. I mean, you think of, you know, someone getting angry and their face getting all red, right? You get hot. You start to sweat a little bit when you get really angry. God's anger got hot with the children of Israel because that does, that makes God hot. The Bible says uh, uh, our God is a consuming fire in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews um, 13. I forget the reference now already. You come up here and, and, and preach and you'll see what I'm talking about. You, I know it's already happened on Christmas, on Christmas or New Year's Eve with a couple of you. It's not as easy as it looks. The Bible says our Lord is a consuming fire. And the Bible also says that, uh, that God is a jealous God. Jealous because he doesn't, want him, he doesn't want the people worshiping anyone else but him. And it makes sense. I mean, think about here. It says they bowed down to them. Just imagine what it must be like for God, the creator. Created, I mean, everything that you see. 
the, the, the amount of complexity that's in life itself, that's, that, that everything that's wrapped into you think of, and this is why the Bible says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. When you look at how complicated everything is that exists in this world, I mean, I was just explaining to my kids the other day about, uh, you know, because they were talking about, it was real foggy, right? So I just kind of explain how, the, you know, there's, there's water molecules in the air, and, and they already know a lot of this stuff. We were talking about it, and I explained to them how, you know, God built in his own filtration system. Through, through, you know, water goes up in the clouds, it comes down in rain, it travels, it picks up minerals, goes into the seas, it evaporates, it goes back up in the air. And through this whole process, any contamination and things that are, that are, that are um, you know, done either by man or, or whatever, gets filtered out so that we can still have a renewable source of, of water and life and, you know, and, and that's just like one really small example. And you think about the way God created our bodies to deal with disease and deal, you know, deal with so many different things. And the process is to, to transfer energy by consuming food and making all of your body parts move together and work together in unison. You know, there's so many things you can say, how could there not be a God? How could there not be a God that created this amazing world and, these and, and, and everything in it? You have to be a fool to not see that there's a God that created all these things. Man, I was getting off on a rabbit trail there. Verse 14, And the anger of the Lord was hot against the earth because... We're trying to imagine how God can get so angry when God has done all of this for his creation. And then to see them prop up some image and get on their knees and bow down and pray to and talk to some inanimate object. Some gold, some silver, some wood. Instead of giving honor and respect and reverence unto the Lord that created them. That makes God angry. And that, you know what? That's who God is. We're not going to make up our fake God and say, oh, all the attributes of God, he's just some pushover or whatever. No. God can be an angry God. Now, God is long-suffering and merciful. Amen. I love it. But let's not forget that God's, God can be an angry God, too. We need to remember that, I think, more often. <laughs> Keep ourselves right. Keep our kids right. Going down the right path. What loving parent would want their kid to just go off, start, start following Satan, start going and worshiping Baal, and then being judged as a result? No one wants that for their kids. Not any loving father, not any loving parent. Verse number 14, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn unto them and they were greatly distressed. So basically at every turn, God's just coming down on them. Why? Because they're going after false gods. This is a really rebellious generation that has come up that rejects the God of their fathers and they worship the gods of this world. Now, this becomes a pattern, as I mentioned before, that they cry to the Lord, Lord raises up a judge to deliver them, but they always seem to be bent on backsliding. It's just, you know, we get this as a summary within this chapter, but as you, if you've read the Bible, you see how much that happens over and over again. Turn, if you would, real quick to Hosea chapter 11. Keep your place here. We're coming back here. Hosea 11 does an, a good job also of kind of summarizing Israel and their backslidings. Hosea 
how quickly people forget the good that God does, how quickly people turn out of the way. And that's, that's kind of, you know, in, in our lives also, a lot of people are just like that, where when bad things happen, you're on your knees praying to God, right? Because you want the bad to stop and you want it to stop quickly. When you're in pain, when you're hurting, when, you know, you're in the hospital, you got something going on, then people are real quick to seek out God. But when things are going good, you're comfortable, everything's going well, eh, what do I need God for? I mean, that's, that's a, common, a common attitude um, among people. And, and that's kind of what happened is that Israel always needed to have someone oppressing them for them to seek out God. And it just happens over and over and over again. And they, and they, don't, they seem to forget really quickly the distress they were in not that long ago from having turned to these other false gods. Look at verse number one of Hosea 11. The Bible says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And of course, that verse right there is, uh, is a reference to Jesus Christ, called my son out of Egypt, that if you've been doing your Bible reading, Matthew, you're going to see that that's quoted in the book of Matthew, talking about Jesus Christ, because when, uh, when um, Herod was going to kill all the children under two years old in order to try to kill Jesus, they fled into Egypt. And then after Herod died, they came back out. And that's what this verse is prophesying there, uh, called my son out of Egypt. Verse number two, as they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burned incense to graven images. I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. He shall not return into the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king because they refused to return. And the sword shall abide on his cities and shall consume his branches and devour them because of their own counsels. And my people are bent to backsliding from me, though they called them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. We see here how God's saying, you know, I love them. I was guiding them. I'm trying to, to take them by his arm and show them the way. And I'm doing all this stuff. Yet they still are just bent on their backsliding. And they continue to just to this, go back and they won't turn back to me. Uh, continuing on here, it says, How shall I give thee up, O Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboam? Mine heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. The Holy One in the midst of thee, I will not enter into the city. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion when he shall roar. Then the children shall tremble from the west. They shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt and as a dove out of the land of Assyria. And I will place them in their houses, saith the Lord. Ephraim compasseth me about with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. See, God has a plan here that even though Israel and Ephraim are doing wickedly, he still, you know, it says Judah shall reign. Of course, it's a reference, again, a prophecy to Jesus Christ of the tribe of Judah, that he's called out of Egypt, that, that God still, even through all of that, God doesn't completely give up and, and ultimately break his promise that he made to Abraham. He's not going to do that, even though the whole nation is kind of turned against him. But we see there, again, another, another synopsis of just what we're finding in Judges chapter 2. Go back to Judges chapter 2. We're going to pick up here in verse number 16. The Bible says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord. But they did not so. So he's saying their fathers, they obeyed the commandments of the Lord. 
But the children didn't. The children didn't listen to their ways. They got in trouble. God sends a deliverer. God sends a judge to get the people back right with God, to, to set them free from their oppression. And what happens? They turn right back around again and, and go back to their old ways. Verse number, uh, verse number 18. And when the Lord raised them up, judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. And that's one of the, the, the key things that, that symbolizes Israel here is their stubbornness. Is that they just, they just won't go back. Now, throughout history, it says here, too, that when God raises up judges, every time they go back to worshiping other gods, they get worse and worse and worse. They get farther and farther and farther away. They, they go... They go deeper into their sin and into their witchcraft and into their false god worship. Now, if this has been the course of history, this happened all the way up through the time of Jesus Christ. We're going to see that. Actually, keep your place here. Turn to Matthew chapter 21. This has continued all throughout history with Israel. It's not hard to understand why there's so much mysticism in the religion of the Jews today, especially when you look at the Kabbalah, you look at stuff like that. There's all kinds of mixing of different religions and, 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 and paganism inside the religion of the Jews today. It, it boggles my mind why Christians want to hold up Jews of Judaism as if they're some special people when they denied the Lord Jesus Christ they put them to death and they reject everything that the Bible teaches and no they don't believe just the Old Testament they don't believe any of it because as Jesus Christ said if you believe if you believe Moses you'd believe me they don't believe Moses law they don't believe in creation they don't believe in the Lord of the Bible they don't believe any of it They'll give lip service to it, but guess what? The Bible already said that about those people. He says, they honor me with, my, with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And he's talking about Israel over and over again. Look at Matthew chapter 21. But you can see, you know, because they've done this back and forth game, Going to other gods, going back to the Lord, going to other gods, going back to the Lord. What they end up doing is they carry bits and pieces still of those old religions with them and incorporate that into their religion. I mean, this has happened with Christianity as well. You can look at different, different uh, parts of the world, different parts of the country even. I mean, that's where the, um, a lot of the, the Pentecostals came from the, the voodoo religion from Africa. So when a lot of Africans were brought to this country from Africa and they brought their religion, well, there were a lot of Christians in this country, right? And so they tried to Christianize the people that were brought over here. And so those people then as slaves, right? I mean, they're, what are you gonna do, right? They, they still wanna keep their religion, but they're, they're now living in a new society so they, they kind of adopt this, this form of Christianity, but they've, they've mixed in all of the, the music. I mean, think about the, 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 the tribal uh, worship with the music and the kind of hyping up and, and being possessed, getting into the spirit world. I mean, that's, that's just, you, you, you mix it in with, with Christianity and what you find is a bunch of tongue-talking Pentecostals that roll around on the ground and foam at the mouth and say that they're in the Spirit. And it's, it's a merging of religion. And it's still a false religion. And that's what's happened with the religion of the Jews. Not the right religion. The Judaism. 
See, the, the true religion of the Jews, the one that God was teaching them, was, is the Bible religion. The Bible religion that Isaiah taught, the Bible religion that Ezekiel taught, the Bible religion that Moses taught, the Bible religion that, that all these, these great men of God taught. That's continued, that Jesus Christ taught. That's now continued to be believed by Bible believers. It doesn't matter to me the name you want to put on it, but I don't think we should be confused about it either. Because today, when you say Judaism, that is not the religion of the Bible at all. That's a religion of people who reject Christ. So I don't even refer to Old Testament believers as believing in Judaism. Because that's just a different religion altogether. And I don't know what you call them, Old Testament saints, believers, whatever. Doesn't matter. The name, the name now doesn't, I mean, Christians, okay, that, that wasn't even come up with by believers. That was a name that other people put on people who followed Christ. I don't have a problem with the name, but it's, it's the same religion, the religion of the Bible. That's the true religion. That's the right religion. But we're in Matthew 21. Let me get there real quick myself. Matthew 21. Look at verse number 33. The Bible says, Here another parable. This is Jesus speaking. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near... He sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But, the last, of, but last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. So this parable that Jesus Christ is, is speaking here, he's just saying, you know, there's this guy that owns this vineyard. He owns this plot of land. And he hires all these servants to work the land for him. And who does the fruit belong to? It belongs to the owner of the vineyard. It belongs to the owner of the land. He's hiring them to be productive, be fruitful, to, to, to reap and do the work in his land for him. But then anytime he's sending people to receive the fruits, they're beating them up, they're hurting them, they're killing them in some cases, and he's just like, man, what am I going to do with these? I mean, what, talk about a rebellious people, right? Rebellious against their Lord, rebellious against their master, saying, huh, who do you think you are coming in here to get the fruit of this land? We're the ones working out here all day. You're, you're not getting any of it. You come here, yeah, come back again. You'll beat one guy up. Send out another one. You're going to kill him. And then the master of the vineyard is like, man, well, I'm going to send my son. So they're going to respect my son. They may not respect these other people I'm sending to them, but they'll respect my son. They see the son, they go, this is the heir. If we kill him, then this is all going to, going to we're going to inherit this land. This could be ours. Obviously, it's a wicked thought. It says in verse 39, they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his, his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. The chief priests and the Pharisees, they're the religion of Judaism. That's where Judaism comes from. It's from the rabbis. It's their rabbinical line that dates back to the Pharisees. If you ask the Jews today, they're going to say, well, which of the Pharisees believed on him? That's why they reject Christ, because they trusted in their leaders, in their rabbis. Watch Marching to Zion. There's a clip of a rabbi basically saying that very statement. Well, none of, none, of the, none of the Pharisees believed on him. None of, the, none of them believed on him. 
None of the theologians at the time, they didn't receive him. And this parable, and they knew they were talking about him. They knew it. They were talking about them. Jesus is referencing all the prophets that God sent unto them because they were shamefully entreated. Look at what happened to Jeremiah when he was, when he was kept in a dungeon in the mire. Look at what happened to Ezekiel. Look at, Isaac. Look at these men of God that have been sent by God and how they were treated, in many cases, even by their own people that didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear the truth. They didn't want to receive it. So what do they do? They, they, they beat them up. They hurt them. They torture them. They kill them. That's what's happened to them. And then when God sent his only begotten son into the world, they kill him. They murder Jesus Christ. But then Christians want to get mad at us because we believe that God has taken the kingdom away from the Jews and given it unto a nation bearing the fruits thereof. Well, that's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus Christ himself said. It's craziness. Look, God's not a racist. God doesn't care where you, you were born from what your line is. He doesn't care how far you can trace back your root and who it goes to because at the end of the day, they're all going to go back to Adam. So what does it really matter? That's not what matters. It's not, he is not a, a Jew, which is one outwardly, according to the Bible, but one inwardly. And circumcision is that, that, not that uh, of the flesh, but that of the heart. That's what God cares about. That's what God has always cared about. Always. That's the true religion. Let's go back to, uh, let's finish up here in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 2. We're almost done. Verse number 20. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because that this people have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. So God uses the heathen, he uses these people of the land to test Israel. He leaves them there. Now, this demonstrates the way that God works with man. The Calvinist will have you believe that everything that happens, God has just made everything happen that way. And that it's only happening that way because God wants it to happen. And even when really bad things happen in this world, well, God wanted that to happen. When a child's molested, well, God wanted that to happen. That's the sick, perverted, twisted God that Calvinists worship. And that, that is what they believe. When you, when you take things to their honest end, well, if God absolutely controls everything, and they, they just like to throw words around like sovereign. Oh, you don't believe in the sovereignty of God? Well, yeah, God is all-powerful. I believe that. But just because he's all-powerful doesn't mean that he's created robots and that there is no way that anybody can resist or, or go against the will of God. Because it's true. They, see, they believe in irresistible grace. But the Bible says, why do you resist the Holy Ghost? Why do you resist? Because they were, were resisting. And the answer wasn't because, well, because God's making me resist. That's ridiculous. God's not schizophrenic. The Bible says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, either he wants everyone to be saved or he doesn't. And he does because the Bible says so. Yet there's still people who aren't saved. So tell me now how that's going to work out with your, with your Calvinist mindset. Well, everything that God wants is going to happen. Well, God wants everyone to be saved. 
but not everybody is saved or going to be saved. But this, is, this shows you how it works because there's always the option, there always had been the option for Israel to do what was right. And the promises of God will always stand. So when God says, hey, if you follow me, if you obey me, I will, you know, the people will run before you, they'll flee before you, I'll drive them out of your land. We saw God did that almost completely. Now, he did that every single time that it was right and every time that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, every single time without fail. But because they failed, God's not held to, to his end of the covenant or the deal when they've already broken it. Now, he still will do that and drive the people out while they're following, while they're obeying, and while they have faith, while they trust in the Lord. Yes. But what this passage is stating here is that God could have driven all the heathen out when Joshua was reigning and, doing, you know, and, and going through the land, but he didn't just drive them out easily. Right? Like it could have just been, he could have driven out everybody. Like we saw before, he was sending the hornets before him. Right? I mean, he could have cleared out the entire nation and wiped all of them out without Israel having to lift a finger. And they could have just waltzed right in and took it. But he decided not to do it that way. He says, no, they're going to have to work for it a little bit. And I'm going to prove them and test them and see where their heart really is. He, why? Because God cares about the heart. He wants to see, are they just going to blow it? Are they going to care about this? I'm going to have them work for it a little bit. Now, he's with them. He's giving them the victories. He's going to do the fighting for them, but he wants them there doing that too. He uses man all the time and lets it up to man to ultimately decide, what are you going to do? As long as, though, God's there to work with you if you're there to work with God. So as long as they're willing to go in and defeat the enemy, and you know what? God's going to work for them and with them and drive them out. And you can be assured of that. And there is, there, you have no reason to doubt or fear of the defeat ever. Because if God be for us, who could be against us? And that's always consistently true throughout the Bible. But if you choose not to trust in the Lord, and you choose to trust in chariots, and you choose to, choose to trust in your own arm and strength and might, and you forsake God, well, guess what? God's not going to be there for you then. And then you're left to your own devices. And with these people, he says, well, I'm going to see where they go. And in some cases, they succeeded. In some cases, they failed. But the choice was on them. When God left, the, he, he just, what it says here, it says, um, verse 23, therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out Hastily. It doesn't say without driving them out, but he could have driven them out very hastily and just been like, boom, they're all gone. But instead, he said, no, I'm going to let them keep working to do it. And this is a similar way, the way that God works with man to do the things that God wants to have. God wanted his, the children of Israel to inherit the land. He wanted all these people driven out. That's what he wanted. But he still left it up to them to decide, are you going to follow? Are you going to obey? Are you going to do it? God wants all men to be saved. But you know what God does? He uses man to do it. God doesn't just come down and speak to people and tell them the gospel as if they can hear some audible voice and understand how to be saved just through God's voice telling them. God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, that we need to reconcile people to God through Jesus Christ, that that work has been given unto believers to do. Nobody's going to get saved unless they hear the word of God. And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? God sends believers out to give people the gospel in order for them to hear, in order for them to believe in their heart and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and call the name of the Lord and get saved. That's how people get saved. That's the only way that people get saved. Amen. It's the only way. Nobody gets saved on their own. Nobody gets saved just from reading the Bible. 
God has given believers the job to preach the word. And man works with God. The Holy Spirit being present when the soul winner opens up his mouth and preaches the word of God and sows the seed in their heart. So when that person gets saved and that new life is born, it's still born of God. And God works through. You know, we can't save anyone on our own at all, ever. Not even close. Yet God still requires us to go forth and do the work in order for people to be saved. He did all the hard work. But he still uses man. And if, and if we choose not to preach the gospel, then there's a lot of people who aren't going to get saved. And that's against God's will, but that's reality and that's the way God made things. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all of the words in Scripture. Lord, we thank you for preserving these words for us to be able to, to learn from. God, I pray that you will please strengthen us, edify us, help us, dear Lord. Help us uh, to teach our children to follow you, to follow the ways of the Bible and of the Lord, and not to just leave them to their own devices or to get sucked into these false religions of the world. God, I pray that you would please just um, help us, help us to grow, help us to reach more people. God, bring more laborers here because the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Lord, we need more laborers in order to, uh, to reap more souls. God, we know that's what you want. It's according to your will. Please, uh, please bring them here to our church that, that we all can be um, strengthened and edified and that we can teach and train more people to do your work. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.